Guys, today we're rolling forward with our marathon of tier lists. I am here dedicated to bringing you the lowest value, clickbaity, algorithm exploiting content that I can. And today we're going to do that with the overhead press by popular demand. Are you getting tired of this? I'm not getting tired of this. Let's get started. All right, we're gonna start out with one of my favorite developmental exercises, the behind the neck press. It gets a bad rap, and I'm here to set the record straight because that is one of my favorite developers. Now, the way that I'm going to rank this stuff, there's a bunch of different criteria. Mainly, it's what's going to get your overhead press stronger, but that could be different if you're focused on military pressing versus push pressing, like what I do in Strongman, or if you're an Olympic lifter, some of this might not apply to you quite the same way. I give higher points to accessibility, things that solve more problems for more people. Something might be the ticket to the next log press world record. You know, if you find out that one of the Stoltman brothers started doing like banded one-legged pin presses and that was a thing. But if that has less application to most people, that's not going to get ranked as high. So getting into the behind the neck press, a lot of worry that it's gonna cause issues, that it's, it's gonna cause injury. You want to train to get good in weak and vulnerable positions. The shoulder can be a finicky bitch. You don't fix that by avoiding anything that puts it in a precarious position. You just have to be smart enough to know that you don't put yourself in that position and then go hard as you fucking can. So behind the neck presses, a huge builder for me early on. I love behind the neck presses. It's something I recommend freely. It's great for hypertrophy phases. If you've never done it before, you're going to excel so quick. You've seen some of the greats like Ed Cohen did a, a 400 pound behind the neck press uh, in his heyday. Paul Carter actually, I think did like a 365 which, I mean, I've never been able uh, to do that feat. So I recommend finding a good rack, uh, getting somebody to help you out of the rack, but learn how to press behind the neck. You can even do it standing. I like to push press my first rep from the front and then go into it. So it's a great movement, highly recommended. I'm gonna put that, I'm gonna put that as S tier. That is certainly an S tier movement. Getting into the next one, let's get a little exotic. Band bell presses or presses where you like dangle weights from bands. I've actually used this quite a bit. This looks like a ridiculous gimmicky movement. Most of you don't need to do this. I've done it to work around injury. When my labrum was torn, when my shoulder was feeling like really unstable, or when I have issues with like tendon inflammation, the fact that there's give when you push makes it a lot more comfortable to press. And the instability, I mean, it cooks your shoulders, especially if you're trying to fight it and press with a tempo. So I really liked it for that purpose. Aside from that, this is really not going to carry over to your one rep max. This is not going to make you a better push presser. This is not going to increase your military press. It's a novelty, it's hard, and there might be some developmental benefit from that, but I'm gonna say carryover is really low here. This is a lot more gimmicky. I'm gonna put it C tier. It is not without value. If you do end up in one of those situations where you have a hard time pressing because of pain, try this out with lightweight, slow for high reps, build up from there. As you feel better, you get blood in the joint over the weeks, you might notice that you can handle straight weight a lot more easily. So not without value, it just doesn't apply to very many people and it's not necessarily going to make you stronger. Next up, going into a split jerk. Let's talk about split jerking. I compete in strongman, a lot of guys split jerk. People find that they can get closer to handling competitive weights sooner. So if you're underdeveloped, you're not very strong, you can get closer to that axle press or log press that's gonna be in the contest and not zero, hopefully. And that's what compels a lot of people to do it. And you have the greatest potential to increase weight. I don't like split jerking as a strongman movement. I understand that, that some people like Nicholas Canby have exploited it to put up big weights. It's in the rules. If you have a skilled Olympic lifter, they're usually going to dominate the overhead press unless it is a movement that is not on a barbell or an axle. Guys have trouble getting it to carry over to the log. You're certainly not going to be able to get it to carry over to, to things like Viking presses or odd presses. So it is limited there. As a developmental movement, split jerking to help your other overhead pressing movements, not gonna do much. Nobody ever hit a push press or a strict press PR because they were jerking. Jerking is very specific. If you do it right, you're taking your upper body out of it and that's how you handle the most amount of weight. So even as a competitive movement, I'm not quick to recommend this because I think people put that in the, at the forefront and forget about developing your body in a way that will actually make you competitive uh, in a variety of movements. So as a developmental movement, I think it's perfectly great as a competitive test, a lot of respect for Olympic lifting. As a variation, as a developmental movement for the rest of us, it ranks low, low. I gotta put a split jerk as, as D tier for developmental reasons. I know that's gonna get some shit and I don't care. I'm talking about what's going to make your overhead press generally stronger. Unless you are a career Olympic lifter, 
the split jerk isn't going to do anything for your other overhead pressing ability. I gotta give a quick shout out to Boost Camp. I have my programs up there, Full Sturker, Kong, Bull Mastiff, and there are many more free programs. It's absolutely free to use. Easy way to log your workouts on your phone. You can look at how different programs are put together. You can make comparisons. You can run them in real time. Super convenient. So go ahead and check out Boost Camp if you have. Let's go into another developmental one, seated Smith pressing. Here we go. Now we're talking about you know, the, this is what you do after you do your curls in the squat rack. You go and do your seated quarter inch uh, military pulses where you're like, ah, right there, just feeling the burn, taking all the work out of it. You got like five plates stacked on each side. Seated military presses, actually great exercise. I'm a big fan of machines as pressing accessory. I'm a fan of machines as accessory, period. It has a role. You can do all your dedicated strength work. This isn't, this doesn't supplant barbell work, free weight work, but as an accessory, as something you do in addition to it, I mean, it's different enough in just the right ways that it'll address some problems. You're stable. You don't have to balance. You can just push hard. That is a unique stimulus and it is, it can be very strength specific. It's also a great developer. You can stay in the pocket. You can do pulse reps. You can play around with the range of motion with, with the tempo and so on. And uh, you can actually get a lot of good hypertrophy work out of this. I'm going to put a seated uh, military press in a Smith machine as an A-tier exercise. I think it's fantastic. Uh, most of you for strength specific purposes can benefit from it by going heavy and having that overload that you expose yourself to uh, without having to balance. I mean, that can allow your delt to just put out more force. Your delts and triceps can put out more force than they would otherwise if you were standing. It's just not quite as specific to a standing press, so it gets marked down a bit. But generally, I think it's a very good developmental exercise. Going into another one, let's talk about dumbbell shoulder presses. Dumbbell shoulder presses are another favorite of mine. I did these a lot when I was younger. I recommend them a lot because it's an easy way to get more delt and tricep work in without burning out your CNS by just doing more and more and more barbell overhead work. So it's a nice variation. The fact that you're out to the side instead of out to the front, however that might be, is also a nice change up. This makes it more similar to a behind the neck. So actually, if you do have shoulder issues, if behind the neck kills, consider this. This is a good substitute. Dumbbell shoulder press developmentally, I mean, it's, it's a great exercise and you're gonna see the best guys doing it. You're gonna see Eddie Hall do dumbbell shoulder presses in training, in prep for his biggest press. You're going to see a lot of the strongest pressers lean on this. It's a really good exercise. I just wouldn't really put this in at the tail end of a peak getting ready for a big overhead press attempt. This is something I would do in the introduction to my training and take out six or eight weeks before a really big press and I would just trade it for really specific contest movement. So a little less specific, but overall a huge developer, viable substitute for the uh, behind the neck press right here. So solid A tier exercise. From there, let's go back into a strongman movement, Viking press, so neutral grip, 98% of the time you can't jerk, so I'm going to address it as that. Some gyms now have a Viking press setup or they have a landmine attachment setup, so it's more viable to do this. Whether you go front or neutral doesn't really matter. That's kind of variation for the sake of it. But as far as the lever arm, as far as having to push out in front, or if you're standing the other way, how to push up and back, that angle really changes the strength curve during the movement, and it provides a, a unique difference. Also, it is more stable. So even if the curve is a little weird, the fact that you can just dig into the machine because the apparatus isn't going anywhere, you can grind through some gnarly reps and your shoulders are gonna cook. If you've never done this and you go into a contest, your shoulders are gonna cook. I actually like Viking presses uh, more so than I would say most machine presses I would do. Uh, this is a very viable overhead press developer, shoulder tricep developer. It's just, again, not as specific to a barbell. If you're prepping for barbell overhead work, this, again, it's good developmentally, not great for strength specific, for that neurological development that requires coordination and specificity to the movement. So I'm going to give Viking presses A tier status. Next up, this is kind of a strongman baby. I believe, I could be misspeaking here, I believe Kale Beck made these popular. I'm talking about Z presses. I don't know if he did or not, but I remember around the time when Z presses came out, everybody started talking about them in the strongman forums. A lot of people mistakenly think that Zadrunas does these. He does not. He said he doesn't. I don't know why they call it Z presses. Sitting on the floor, spread eagle, doing a, a press off the pins. For those of you who haven't done it, it's very uncomfortable. It's uh, hard to balance. You feel your hip flexors cramping up because once you hit that stick point, your tendency is to lean back. And if you lean back in that position, you'll fall over. So you notice that you have to slow down your press. You have to commit to staying upright while pressing and your hip flexors are just working super hard to keep you from going ass over tin cup. 
That being said, I get what it's trying to do. I get why people do it. I personally think that if you're trying to develop your ability to press weight standing on your own two legs, you're going to do that by pressing weight standing on your own two legs. You're not going to do it by doing variations to help you press weight standing on your own two legs. We're not talking about force production. It's different when you're talking about building horsepower in the main movers, but we're talking about a, a coordination exercise. Very weird. Uh, one of the most gimmicky movements I see, there's some people I still see continuing to prescribe it, even though you don't really see this being the thing that leads up to the world's biggest overhead presses. I've never known anybody that had a shitty press and they started doing a lot of Z presses and they're like, oh man, like military presses weren't working, but the Z presses really took it home. So I don't think these do a lot and I'm biased because I think it's gimmicky strongman shit, which I don't like. So I'm going to be probably a little extra harsh to this movement. I'm going to call it a D tier movement. I don't like Z presses at all. I think whatever you can derive from those, you'd be better off deriving from other movements and other types of variation. That's my two cents about that. Next up, going into uh, just a standard seated press. Huge fan of these, and I use these a lot in my training. For years, I did standing overhead presses. Now, they're great, and I don't regret that at all. I think it's, it's vital to learn how to press weight standing out of a rack. However, after years of doing that, going back to a seated press, the stability and the fact that I could just dig my back into the bench and just push, the, the strength that I built in my shoulders, that is so much more strength specific because the horsepower of your shoulders is the limiting factor, not the ability of your abs to like not cramp up while you're leaning back and trying to do a standing incline press. So a uh, big fan of them, I'm using them currently. Uh, only thing is just keep in mind, it is mechanically different than a standing press. If you get really, really, really good seated, that doesn't necessarily mean you can pull off a good standing press. And I even experienced that recently. I started phasing back in standing presses and it wasn't a one-to-one -one correlation. My shoulders feel stronger, but I still have to get back into the rhythm of, of pressing. So keep in mind that difference in specificity, that's important. But seated presses, huge fan of. I'm gonna call it S tier. If we're talking about variations that can help get you through that overhead press plateau, that can help you strict press or push press more, it doesn't get much better than seated presses. I mean, similar mechanics, but just super, uh, super overloaded, so you can handle a lot more weight. Great strength specific movement. Up next, uh, Tsunami Bar. Man, the fuckery that's going on. And uh, I gotta talk a little bit of shit. Nick Camby's not gonna be happy with me because he endorses Tsunami Bar. He sells the shit out of it. He does so much training with it. And I don't think he does it as a gimmick. I think he does it because he likes it. He's been posting these types of videos long before he got a sponsorship with them. But I believe Nick Camby is good. He has the, the every overhead record you could have in the middleweight division, log, axle, I think block. Camby is so good because one, he has a fucking strong upper body. He, his push press is very high. Most of the guys that are really good at jerking have shitty push presses. He has a high jerk and a high push press. He's skilled. He's worked with Russian weightlifting coaches. He actually knows how to jerk and he's built up that skill. So I'm not sold that a major piece of his game is the floppy bar. And I see a lot of people buying it, a lot of people using it. I used it a couple times at the gym. I've seen some other people use it. I think it's a good variation for the sake of it. If you want somebody to get some work in when they're fried to let their CNS recover, okay. But it's, it's unstable, but not in the right kind of way. In fact, you can actually learn to kind of game the whip if you let it flex where you wait. And on the way back up, if you punch through, it, it's like extra mustard on your push press. So it can be gamed. Developmentally, what does that mean? I don't know. I see the fact that he's using it is going to be what, what saves it from a D tier movement. I think most of you have no business using this. I, actually, no, I got to go back. It's got to go D tier because all of you guys watching this are going to see this and think, oh, I got to try it out, see what it's about. For 99% of you, it's not going to do anything except distract you from the heavy pressing work you need to do. So I'm going to put Tsunami Bar D tier. Sorry, Camby. Uh, I know that's your baby, but I don't think it is the difference between your world record or not having a world record. And I think it is the difference between droves of lifters fucking up their training with a bunch of distracting nonsense. That's my two cents. Getting into the next one, standing pin presses or seated for that matter. Uh, well, look, it's me. Oh, it's me doing standing pin press. This is back when I was strong. That I think is 410 on the bar. And... I love these movements. I've talked about pin presses before for bench and for overhead press. It teaches you to go from a dead stop, no stretch reflex. You're, if you set it at different heights, you're now building mechanical tension and having to rely on drive at a point in the movement where there's normally momentum. And that is night and day. Your nervous system will respond to that, trust me. And if it is around a stick point, 
by the time you notice your ability increase at that range, that's no longer gonna be a, str uh, a stick point. Also cool thing with like post activation potentiation, if you do a lot of pin press, let's say at eyeball level and you get kind of heavy, if you then go to like a regular full range press, I'm not kidding, you push, once you get here, it feels like somebody took 10% off the bar. You'll notice that your lockout just goes so much quicker. So you can actually do some type of contrast training where you pair that together. Uh, most of you don't need to get that complex. In fact, I probably recommend against it, but it is an option. Standing strict presses did a lot for my press. Uh, seated uh, strict presses from the pins did a lot for my press. So the overload, very strength specific. I think this also does carry over a lot to whatever implement you're gonna use because you can do it with an axle. You can do it with a, a log. You can do it with all these other implements and it works very well. S tier huge, huge fan of, uh, of pin presses. Going into uh, just a good old fashioned push press. Let's talk about push pressing. It's my competitive movement. I like it because in strongman, I can, I can press more weight, obviously, than just my arms can press. I can use my legs. But by building that skill, I'm stable. So I'm actually able to do it with the highest number of implements. You can't jerk on all the implements. You can push press on all the implements. So it wasn't until I went back from jerking and started focusing specifically on my push press. And it took a, it took a couple of years to build that gap up where my push press was as good as my jerk. And by the time I got there, I was good at so many other movements. I just didn't lose overhead press movements unless I was at like worlds or something. So that did a lot. I love it as an accessory to people who are just focused on their strict press. It is a good, easy way to get overload. Uh, it'll tax your upper back more. You'll be very surprised what it does for the rest of your body besides your, your delts and, and triceps. And it uses the overhead press how I like it, holistically in the context of your whole body. Push pressing, S tier all the way, no matter what your goals are, everybody is justified having push pressing at some phase of their training. And I prescribe it for almost, almost all of my, uh, all of my clients. Uh, going into uh, the starting strength press, the good old Olympic lifting press. This is, I think, the press 2.0, it's called. I know there's some context there. I'm probably going to screw up. I don't care. We're talking about the press where you use the hips to supplant a knee drive. So the knees stay locked, but you're still getting lower body drive by uh, moving your hips back and forth. You like hump into the bar, and then as you fall back, you push, and that, that whip gives you some upward momentum. Just like Vasily Alexiev and Serge Redding did back in the day to get those like 500 pound strict presses over their head, which is still one of the most impressive feats you'll ever see. Not a fan of this though, mainly because it isn't accessible. It requires being part of like this kind of cult of lifting where you dedicate enough time to get good at it. And that's time not spent doing actual upper body developers. I understand the impulse to have this featured as kind of a throwback. And if you are good at it, if you're skilled, I imagine it's an okay developmental exercise. It's like putting a kip on your, on your overhead press, which is kind of what a push press is doing. I just think it is unnecessarily complex. It's very inaccessible. And I think the people that end up getting drawn to this fall into that like odd lift category where they're less concerned about getting strong and more concerned about paying homage to like outdated methods of lifting. So I don't like it for that reason. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be extra harsh. I'm going to rank it lower than I should based on its potential ability to develop you. I think it could potentially be an okay developer, but all of those other things just rub me the wrong way. I'm gonna go D tier with that. I'm noticing a trend. I have very strong opinions on the overhead press. I wonder why that is. Next, going into the bent press. Old timey movement that I actually like. Same problem with uh, lifters getting involved with this ahead of the stuff that's actually going to develop you physically. It's more about the strength culture, paying homage to old methods of movement, but it is a viable skill. Great way to overload the upper body. One arm bent presses, you can handle some weight when you know how to do this, but it does take a ton of time and attention away from the fundamentals. So I got to rank it down for that. This is something I've been having to drill to help my circus dumbbell, but I hate circus dumbbell. I don't like, it's a parlor trick of a movement. I'm going to talk about that later, but this position, learning how to hit your hips to the side and kind of push away from the, from the bell. That was kind of a vital skill. Um, there's worse things you could do. If you're going to talk about gimmicky shit, there's worse things you can do. I like this more than the, the press 2.0 because it is different enough. It's one arm, it's unilateral, and you can get some real overload. And the fact that it requires some hip mobility, it does some other things well that the press 2.0 really doesn't do. I'm going to call this B tier. I'm only gonna recommend this to people that, that have to get good at circus dumbbell, or if you really do have that vintage, old-timey strongman itch you wanna scratch, this is one of the few that I would recommend you looking into. For everybody else, go ahead and skip it. 
All right, going on to a push jerk. Now this is different than a split jerk. A split jerk, you jump, you move your feet apart, you fall under the weight. So you're very much pushing yourself under the weight rather than pushing the weight overhead. The push jerk or a power jerk, you keep your feet together. You might kick them apart a little bit, but you don't split. Now, the reason that I'm talking about this is because it is a substantially different movement to get down. It's more accessible to a lot of people. I got really good at push jerking before I was ever a good overhead presser. So I would like win overhead events, but I would like zero a log or a, some odd object because if I couldn't get in the pocket, if I couldn't get super tight like I could with a barbell, I was weak, my lockout wasn't good. So with my short arms, I just exploited the shit out of it. And I got, I got really good. The thing is, when I was at the peak of my push jerking training, I was going twice a week, pretty heavy for a lot of practice reps, working up, working back down twice a week or more, my shoulders exploded. I was really surprised. Now I was doing like a sloppy strongman push jerk, so I wasn't sticking it at the bottom. I decided to catch and lock out those last couple of inches and I didn't really dip under it very much. So it was kind of a bastardized movement, but it worked for me. Anyways, this can potentially be a developer that works to your benefit over a split jerk because there is still pushing involved, there's still pressing with your upper body involved, and you can overload it. So that overload might be a useful trade-off for you guys. If you're not directly competing in strongman, I would skip this entirely. Whatever hypothetical benefits it'll have, not even remotely close to what some of the other pressing variations will do, while still being a lot more technical and having a higher barrier to entry, if you are a strong man, I do recommend working this in at some point. If you find that it's comfortable and you like it, dedicate time to it. It will make just about everything go up. The way I said a, a split jerk won't help your general pressing, this will. This will help your shoulders grow a little bit. This is a nice overload movement to have in conjunction with that. I'm going to give it C tier just because it is so uh, non-specific to anybody who isn't a strong man. Uh, but I do recommend it uh, looking into it as a viable training option if you are trying to get your foot in the water to compete in strongman. Much easier to push jerk a lot of odd implements, carries over to more things, it's stable. If you're gonna jerk for reps, much easier to push jerk for reps and split jerk for reps. So it does some things right. Just developmentally for generally getting your overhead press ability higher, I'm going to say it's non-specific enough that uh, I would skip it. Going into circus dumbbell presses to follow up the bent pressing. I'm gonna save you the suspense, this is D tier. I hate circus dumbbell pressing and I'm not even bad at it. It just takes me a lot of training to get competitive at it. It's something I lose if I'm not drilling it regularly. Part of it is because I was the best presser in several contests where I bombed the dumbbell press. So I'm bitter about that. I'm not gonna lie, that biases me a little bit. But even if, I, if I'm if i charitable and I look at the people that drill it, they get really good at it. If I think of where I've been when I was really good at it, when I've hit the heaviest numbers, I've done a 200 pound dumbbell for reps. Um, Still, I would say it hasn't done a lot for my upper body. Bent pressing requires so much control and positioning and you're under tension the entire time. Where this, it's like the split jerk for your upper body. I don't know. And it's just, it's big, it's awkward. You're trying not to smash yourself in the face. If you're a strong man, you have to do it. I would not be disappointed one bit if they stopped putting a circus dumbbell in every big contest. If you're not a strong man, you don't have anything to gain from this. I'm gonna tell you that right now. So D tier for the circus dumbbell press, better ways to get a strong upper body, better ways to develop functionality and usefulness. Going into a block press. Oh man, I hate block pressing too. God, odd pressing. Now I can't be as critical here because this developmentally does some nice things, but this is another one where it's like, okay, I have the best press on a barbell, but I'm going to place mid pack because I have a hard time like getting my hands underneath the implement. I literally had a contest where it was a natural stone press and I bombed it because I physically couldn't get my hand back packed in underneath. So I had this thing sitting on my chest, this 300 pound rock. I was sly, I got this arm in, and then I was trying to get this arm down, and the lip was just low enough I couldn't pull it down. So I was leaning all the way back, my back was cramping, and the whole time I'm like, why am I fucking doing this? Now, of course, this is something that once you get good at, you're like, oh, it's the best event ever, I love this. And that's, that's how it goes. I'm not gonna tell you I'm not biased, the bad experience I've had with some of these movements definitely informs my decisions. But being as objective as I can, developmentally, odd pressing, it's pretty good. I mean, whatever benefits you could say you get from standing military presses, odd object pressing does that and a little bit more. The lack of load you're gonna be using is made up for the awkwardness and the difficulty and the extra control you have to demonstrate, the time under tension. 
I still bitch to this day when it's, it's implemented as a competitive exercise. I'm gonna give it B tier, odd object pressing. I would not be mad if some of you guys seeking big overhead numbers dabbled in some odd object pressing overhead. Um, I recommend blocks, sandbags can be fun. Just don't do an Atlas stone because they're round, that's stupid. It's easy for the sto uh, stone to slip and smash in the face. That's happened to people. No bonus points for that. But anything that's longer and rectangular is gonna work. Log pressing. Big fan of log pressing, I do it a lot. This is my least objectionable strongman overhead pressing implement. Um, and it's kind of like a board press for your upper body. The thing is when you get good at a log press, the fact that it sits up high on your chest is a bigger benefit than the awkwardness of the log is a detriment. So it's in your best interest to do them and get good at them. Enough gyms have them, it's easy to start. Even if you're not a strongman, I would recommend starting with log strict pressing and then working up to things like push presses after that. But I think it's a very viable method of overloading. It's just not quite as accessible. It does have a learning curve. Might not be necessary for most of you, but this is another one. Would not be mad if you guys dabbled. In fact, I'm gonna rank it a bit higher than the odd object stuff because I think it is more specific to a barbell. So it's called log pressing and A tier movement. Going into accommodating resistance. I've revisited this on every single uh, variation tier list we've done so far, and I'm probably gonna have to do it for deadlifts as well when I do that one. Chains, bands, pain in the ass to set up pain in the ass to keep track of. Even when I had a gym and I, I committed to figuring it out, see what I could get out of these. The time it took me to set it up and get the tension just right was so dumb. And it, it doesn't do anything really that much different than a push press. Push press is the, the exact same thing. It's, it's lightened at the bottom. And then when momentum dies out, you're overloaded at the top. And that's more specific to what you'll do in contest. So just for the pain in the ass to set up and for the fact that Again, novices, intermediates who should be focusing on more foundational movements, they get distracted with this shiny bullshit and they waste a half hour setting it up. That's a half hour of work you could have done. So accommodating resistance, I'm sure there's really elite guys that have made good use of it and it was the difference between their next PR. But again, I rate accessibility and how many problems it solves versus how many problems it creates against the fact that it made one world-class presser really, really good. And then we have just a basic standing military press. We saved the best for last, the foundational movement, standing on your own two feet, pressing weight overhead. I think this is finally taken over the bench press. If it's not more popular, it's at least given more respect than bench pressing as it should be. It was not that way when I started lifting. Very few people did, did shoulder work, period, but almost nobody did standing presses. Great for Developing strength that is meaningful. If you ever have to use your pressing muscles, it is standing on your own two feet, whether or not you're pressing directly overhead. Great for the upper back, the midsection. My abs get sore from standing presses, from fighting the lean back. Um, it, it's a more holistic movement, I really like it. And it's really easy to get good enough to where it's no longer the limiting factor of the rest of your body and the coordination, where you can really just focus on hitting big weights and get your shoulders bigger in the process. As a main foundational movement, it's at least as good as seated presses, and I gave seated presses S tier. So standing military press, basic good old fashioned military press. So look at this lineup of exercises. These are my go-tos. This is what you see me prescribe most people. Military presses, behind the neck, pin presses, push presses, and then a healthy amount of strongman specific event with some seated or dumbbell variations. That's most of it. So that's all I got for today, guys. Let me know what you think about this list. We still have deadlifts coming up. I got some requests for some, some real crazy tier lists. I'm kicking around the idea of doing. Uh, keep the ideas coming. I love the creativity and I really like this format. So I will sprinkle these in in the future as I get good ideas for them, as long as it facilitates a good discussion. So leave your comments in the comment box. Better yet, take them to Patreon where you can see me implement these principles in real time with my daily uploaded training videos. Thank you so much for watching guys. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.